Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy that, just like me, understands that cold beer is so much better than money in the bank. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Cherry Limeade Slush by Wiley Roots Brewing Company, garage grade four out of five bottle caps, and I don't even like sours. That's how good this thing is. Look, it's August, it's hot out, start your evening with something refreshing. This is light, sweet, a little tart, and very, very delicious. And this week's beer was brought to us by, first up, our good friend Julie in Woodstock, Ontario, Canada. And a big shout out to Deborah in Phoenix, Arizona. And a cheers to our friends Bruzy in Parts Unknown and Tessa in Parts Unknown. And a big cheers mates to Madison in Fletcher, Australia. And a long distance cheers to Ava in Selbridge, Ireland. And last but not least... Cheers to Ryan in Linwood, New Jersey. Thanks, everybody, for helping out with this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's shows, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And back by popular demand, a lot of people missed the hoodie sales the first time around. Then they missed it again on the second time around. So They didn't miss it, Captain. They're just lazy. They're like, you know what? Those hoodies will be around forever. I'll get one eventually. And then they went away, and they're like, oh, I didn't get my hoodie. So yeah, the so, captain brought him back. Yeah, so go do that now. You have till next Wednesday, August the 29th, to get your pre-order in. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around. Grab a chair. Grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Police shared with you any of their theories on what happened? No, they haven't, and we have an agreement with them from the outset that um, all that information uh, would be kept to the law enforcement um, for two reasons. One, they don't want to compromise the search, and two, they don't want to endanger Molly. Yeah, I know that you have your own theory, and I know it's speculation, but your intuition has told you that you believe she's with someone she knows. Can you just expound on that and why you think that? Well, I I do want to point out that it really is just speculation on uh, a father's part that has lots of time and imagination. And I'm looking for a logical way to bring Molly home. And so it's just that. And I think it's taken on a little bit of a life of its own the last couple days. But um, it isn't inconceivable that Molly left with someone that she knows. Well, good morning to you, Captain. Good morning. Thank you. Well, we had every intention of discussing the disappearance of Molly Tibbetts from Brooklyn, Iowa this morning. She's been gone for almost five weeks now. But as we sit here in the garage, there has been breaking news in this case. Her body has been found. Of course, that is not the outcome that anybody wanted, but it is something. Now, our intention this week was to bring light to her disappearance, to bring light to the case, and hopefully get the answers that the family wants and needs. So, I think what we do going forward is we continue with the information that we've collected over the last week go through that, and see where this will take the investigation. Now, we occasionally cover fresh cases like this one. In 2017, we covered the Delphi murders uh, just several weeks into the investigation, and there was a lot of speculating that we had to engage in, pulling together accurate, complete information in open, active cases is a real challenge. 
For one thing, there is all kinds of misinformation out there. Uh, Molly Tibbetts' case has received a ton of national media attention. And unfortunately, often the media reports things wrong in a rush to get a scoop or reports information prematurely before it has been debunked or dismissed. To further complicate matters in an open investigation, investigators do not release all or even most of the information that they have. In some cases, they even engage and encourage the spread of wrong or misleading information as part of a strategy to help them solve the case. All of these things, Captain, force us to try to read between the lines of public statements. The investigation is very active, and our original goal was to generate some tips in the case of her disappearance, to lead to finding Molly. But now that we know that she has been found and she's dead, we hope to continue the investigation to find the perpetrator of her murder. I just want to personally thank everybody that sent for the last probably four weeks uh, emails asking us to cover this case. Molly Tibbetts was a 20-year-old student at the University of Iowa studying psychology. Her parents are divorced. Her mom, Laura Calderwood, lives in Brooklyn, Iowa, a tiny rural town of just 1,400 people along Interstate 80. Molly's dad, Rob Tibbetts, lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Molly was born in San Fran. Molly has two brothers, older brother Jake and younger brother Scott. Molly, at high school, she met her boyfriend, Dalton Jack, who was a senior when she was a junior. At the time of her disappearance, they had been together for more than two years. Jack did not go to college with Molly in Iowa City. Instead, he went into the family business along with his brother working construction. Dalton and his brother Blake lived together in a house in Brooklyn along with Blake's fiance Amy Houghton. And Molly was an avid runner. She was very athletic, probably 5'2 to 5'3 in height. Yeah, she was about 120 pounds. She had long, dark hair, brown eyes, and wore glasses or contacts. And she was very close with um, her brothers, specifically her brother Jake, with whom she even shared a vehicle with. He also attended the University of Iowa. The vehicle that they shared was a silver Pontiac G6. On the 18th of July, which was a Wednesday... Molly was staying at the home of her boyfriend's house. You know, so this is her boyfriend's house along with his brother and his brother's fiance. Yeah. Amy, the fiance, is actually the owner of the house. Now, the house has been described as, quote, on the edge of town. It's a large property. It has a large cornfield on this property. And then there are other fields near the property. And I think, Captain, the description of, quote, on the edge of town could not be more accurate. I mean, a quick Google search of this thing, looking this up on maps, uh, it is very much that. You see the town just to the east of it and near this home. And if you go continue west, it just gets more and more country road as you go. And have you seen a picture of this house? Uh, I have seen just the maps, just the Google maps. It's very, very well put together, very clean, very, it's very adorable, actually. Like, it's just like when you see it, you just, it's like a perfect little American house. Now, on the evening of the 18th, Molly was to be staying at this home. I guess over the course of the summer, Molly moved back and forth between this home, which is located on West Des Moines Street. And her mother's home, which is nearby on Bay on Bear Drive, sorry. When staying at Dalton's, Molly would often go to her mom's house for dinner, to have dinner with her mom and her brothers. Yeah. Part of the confusion about some of this case and what items and or clothing may be missing in this case stems from the fact that according to Molly's mom, she kept some of her belongings at Dalton's home and she kept some of her belongings at her mom's home. Yeah, it's been reported several ways, like when they got back, when she got back from college, that she quote unquote moved in with her boyfriend, but it seems like it was it was kind of like shared time between the boyfriend's house and the mother's house. This is complete speculation here, Captain, but I, I did put a little bit of thought into this and I think it might clear up some of that confusion. Just keep in mind, she would have only needed a place to stay for the summer. 
Right. And her mom lives nearby. I get the impression that her boyfriend traveled from time to time for work. You know, he would be sent off to job sites that might be a good enough distance away that he should just stay overnight for several nights. Right. Well, then it might be a little weird to kind of just stay there with your boyfriend's brother or your boy, you know, your boyfriend's soon to be sister-in-law. Well, but she was really good friends with the boyfriend's brother or the brother's uh, fiance. Yeah. And the way that I kind of get this to me is that most likely when her boyfriend was in town, she probably stayed at the boyfriend's house. When the boyfriend's out of town due to work, probably stays at mom's. Right. Something as simple as that. We've all done something similar to that. On this day, on the 18th, Molly was supposed to stay at the boyfriend's house to dog sit Blake and Amy's two dogs. Uh, so her boyfriend Dalton was away on work approximately 120 miles away. He left around 4.30 Tuesday morning on the 17th and was scheduled to return on that Friday. Blake and Amy were in Ames, Iowa at the time. Apparently, Amy was working or is working in Ames this summer, and Blake was there visiting her. Right. There is a report that Blake was going only for one night. Molly went to work on the day of the 18th. We know this because she was videoed by a friend at work. They were goofing around. The first piece of information that we have about her whereabouts on that evening of the 18th is from her brother, Jake, who dropped her off at the uh, at Dalton's house where she was dog sitting. Right. He has told police that this was right around 5.30 p.m. Presumably, Molly was just getting off work, and since she and Jake shared a car, he gave her a ride. Have you seen this video of her at work? I did not. I mean, the when you're diving into a case and trying to shed light and you're trying to figure out who this individual is, um, it's a very small snapshot, but it's just you can just see her personality and you can see how, I mean, she's just kind of being goofy. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, but a lot of people are goofy and, and, and it's actually not that funny, but she was actually quite funny. She likely would have come into the house and first thing, probably released the dogs. Apparently they were kept in the basement when nobody was home. After this, this is when the timeline gets very fuzzy. So what we have heard is that she and Dalton did a little Snapchatting back and forth and that she was texting her mom about dinner. It seems like the majority of the conversations that she would have uh, with her boyfriend and I think friends and family would be through text or Snapchat or some kind of social media form. One of the things confusing the timeline is that it seems that maybe Molly was considering going to dinner at her mom's, but did not show up. According to her mother, the last time that she, she talked to Molly via text, Molly asked what's for dinner. Laura responded brats. Molly's response was a noncommittal. Okay. At some point after this exchange, Molly set out on a run. Apparently, she prefers to run for about 45 minutes a day, several days a week. Right. And her family said that Molly preferred to run in the evenings in summer before the sun went down. But, you know, it's a little cooler out at that time. Right. She has running routes that she prefers, although she would vary them a little day by day. She would always run with her iPhone. It's a gold iPhone 7S and an arm holster. Uh, her wireless white earbuds, and her Fitbit, which she wore apparently all the time. One of the few facts that seems to be undisputed is that she did go out for a run. She was seen by several people. These witnesses reported that they saw her wearing, in, in the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, seems to have accepted this description as they later made it public. And this description reads, Her last known articles of clothing is believed to be dark colored running shorts, a pink sports top, and running shoes color unknown. The time frame for this run is thought to be around 7.30 p.m., meaning she started the run around 7.30 p.m. Right. I do want to be clear here, Captain, because I did see several other reports, and and if this can help in any way, we want to make sure we put out all the information the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation released that statement. 
Okay. Dark colored running shorts, a pink sports top and running shoes color unknown. The other reports that I read state that it could have been a red sports top or a dark colored or black sports top. So just in all, all fairness, we need to put that out there. The Daily Mail reported that um, a witness who reported seeing Molly around 730 was a neighbor. This is Nate Hopwood. He saw Molly jogging on West Pershing Drive, not too far from the Jack home, from her boyfriend's home. Right. Another Brooklyn man has come forward who says that he saw someone who he believes was Molly jogging by his house that night sometime between 8 and 9 p.m. I read that twilight that night was around 8.47 p.m. This man, Devin Riley, told authorities that he had seen the same girl running past his home regularly. His address is 317 East 2nd Street. He told the media that after... Should we be giving out his address? Well, there. if you look up uh, Molly Tibbetts and you look up this case... Okay, it, it'll come up. Yeah, well, it, it brings up a pretty precise map of the possible running route that it is believed that she took. Okay. You can find any of these addresses on here. This is also things that I didn't drive through the town asking questions. These things were found in simple um, internet searches and in local newspapers. Well, and like you said earlier, it's a town of under 1,500 individuals, so you would assume that almost everybody knows everybody. Yeah, and he told the authorities that he had seen this same girl. It seems to me like he doesn't know her by sight because he's just saying, hey, I've seen somebody that looks like her or this same girl possibly running regularly past my home. Well, she has been at college. So so he would only be seeing her running that route over the summer as well. Mm -hmm. So after this gentleman reported the potential sighting to the authorities, The authorities did do a walkthrough of his home, which he told the media lasted for just about 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. I was kind of joking about this with one of my buddies is because the guy that saw one of the guys that saw her, one of the eyewitnesses, he he comes off like, oh, that guy could be a suspect. Mm -hmm. But then I was explaining to my buddy that anybody, um, one, the first thing is this guy came forward later and said, hey, I saw her running. And so giving information to the police is is a very good thing. But then also being willing to say, hey, come into my house. Yeah. And it and so it'd be hard. Look, you've been in front of some cameras. Sometimes you don't know how you're coming off. Right. And I think he does come off a little weird. And I know a lot of people initially was like, hey, you need to check this guy out. But uh, But mind you, news reporters are coming to his house after he's reporting a missing girl and he's just giving an interview, you know? Well, and here's the thing too. He's doing what we ask everyone to do in this situation. If you think you saw something, say something, report it. And he's exactly, he's even if he gets nervous in front of the cameras or even if he gets nervous in front of law enforcement, doesn't technically mean that he's guilty of anything. He's doing what we've asked. Please come forward with any information at all. And then by the way, the way that this works I'm sure that it was as simple as this. Police say, would you mind if we take a look around your house for a few minutes? And he goes, sure, come on in. Right. You know, so that's as much as you can really do being somebody that maybe saw something of importance that was just going about their regular day, living their regular life. Yeah, yeah. My point to my friend was just, you just don't know how you're going to come across. And I think initially a lot of people thought, hey, this guy needs to be checked out. He was checked out. Finally, a person... came forward and said that he may have seen Molly that night through his living room window as he was watching TV. He says the woman that he saw was walking, not running, and he is at 64 Jackson Street. This is Roger Thompson. He said he is, quote, almost certain that it was Molly that he saw. Any or all of these eyewitness sightings, though, we have to question if they are accurate. These are people that are calling with information, trying to help. But if she's an avid runner, like you said, running several days a week, did they get the the date right? Right. Was the times right? And was the runner that they saw even, in fact, Molly? So that's pretty much all we know about that night. And until the next morning when people are going to be texting her boyfriend, 
is going to be texting her. Her mother is going to be texting her, and she's not going to be replying to anybody. And she also misses work. Mm-hmm. And this is going to throw up some big red flags. Yeah, it will. The red flags will start Thursday morning on the nineteenth around seven thirty a.m. Her brother Jake texted Molly to see if she needed a ride to work. She didn't respond. Remember, they shared a vehicle. So I would imagine this is common communication between the two of them. Right. According to her boyfriend, Dalton, he texted her a good morning early that day, but received no response. Molly was supposed to report to work at 8 a.m., but never made it there. Her work was about 15 miles away. Dalton texted her again around lunchtime just to say hi. He said later he didn't. In a later interview, he said he didn't at the time really become alarmed until her friend from her work called him looking for Molly. Right. Work had called her phone apparently, but it was going to voicemail. The friend told Dalton that Molly had not called in and had not shown up to work. Dalton checked his phone at this time and noted that Molly had never even opened any of the messages that he had sent her. So this is sometime around early afternoon on the 19th. He called Molly again and again and again and it always went straight to voicemail. And I don't think we have the information on when his last messages were sent to her. No. Like, if did he send messages at 7 uh, p.m. and they weren't open, or did he send them at 6 p.m. and they weren't open? I don't think we have that information. No, not times. I'm going off of his words, and his wor- words were, I sent her uh, a message in the morning and then another one again around lunchtime. But those weren't checked, but I'm saying were all of his messages the night before checked? That's a great question, Captain, because what we know from Dalton's words is that he checked all of the messages that Molly had sent to him on that night. Right. What we don't know is what he sent her and if all of it or any of it was checked, which might help us pinpoint a more accurate time of when trouble started happening. So soon in the afternoon on the 19th, This is when family members and her boyfriend, Dalton, they were calling all family and friends looking for Molly. Molly's mom, Laura, called the police around 5.15 p.m. and reported her missing. According to Dalton, he started rushing home. When the sheriff's department showed up at the house, they found the door unlocked and seemingly nothing disturbed. The dogs, according to Dalton, were found in the basement when he arrived at the house. Remember, the basement was where the dogs were usually kept when no one was home. Yeah. Some reports say that the basement door was locked, but this is not confirmed. According to Dalton, there was no sign that either of the dogs had fought with an intruder or had been distressed or agitated in any way. Just to be perfectly clear, though, there are reports out there. It's a bit confusing as to whom arrived at the home first. There are reports that state that Dalton arrived first, there are reports that state that law enforcement arrived at the home first. Right. Cheers, mates. The police investigation, they started investigating pretty much right away. They talked to Molly's family and friends and determined quickly that this was not consistent at all with any of her past behavior. Searches were conducted by air. They used helicopters and small planes and even drones were used. On land, they searched with canines and 200 volunteers. We have an issue here, though, Captain, because... The town of Brooklyn is surrounded by tall, tightly packed acres of eight to nine foot tall cornfields, which you can imagine is extremely, extremely difficult to search. Blake Jack told the media that investigators and scent dogs had searched the property, quote, a bunch of times. Sheriff Kriegel told the media that he was confident that every home, farm, barn, and shed in Brooklyn had been searched. Molly's family, in the week or so following her disappearance, they continued to try to call and text her, but her phone went straight to voicemail. 
The FBI joined the case around July 24th, I believe, sending a large number of agents to assist in the investigation, particularly because of the technical nature of much of the evidence or potential evidence. On the Tuesday after Molly went missing, the Sheriff's Department held a press conference on the local ABC News affiliate. Sheriff Tom Kriegel said he was concerned that it was an abduction. He said his department had a reasonable timeline that Molly was out jogging around 730, 745, but they did not know anything later than that. He said that his department had cleared Dalton Jack as a suspect. We don't know what they base this on, but the sheriff's department must know something we don't. I'm well, a, like we stated before, though, he was roughly over 120 miles away. Uh, I also believe at this point they cleared the father because he was living in San Francisco, and mm-hmm. I think they could tell that he was um, in California when she went missing. I also believe at this point they also cleared both of the brothers. Mm-hmm. Not sure why, but they, they did clear clear them. So in regards to all of these people, even more specifically Dalton, the boyfriend, what I'm assuming here, you know, as we stated, they must know things we don't. But I'm assuming here with Dalton that his alibi, he was in Dubuque, Iowa, as you said, 120 miles away. Yeah. This alibi must have been checked and rechecked. It could have been that he has an alibi based off of hotel room or video records, eyewitnesses, or even some form of electronic tracking. Right. But whatever police are relying on, the alibi for Dalton seems to be airtight. Same as we would have to guess with her father and with the brothers. Right. And this probably includes Dalton's brother as well. Yeah. And again, anytime you have a missing person case, that there is some reason to believe that possibly that Molly would take off on her own. But I think this video footage um, the day before she went missing shows Molly was very happy. And and I think with uh, her family and friends knowing her, this is not an option. This is option we can take off the table. Her father actually believed and this was just a gut feeling, and you heard this in the trailer, that that somebody that she knew took her. So we have a situation where law enforcement is saying that she was abducted by somebody. They're not leading you to believe whether she knew the person or not. And, And then the father's coming out saying his gut feeling is that the person knew her or she knew the person. Some other information that we learn regarding that press conference... Um, is that Sheriff Kriegel, he did say that he believed that the Snapchat opened by Dalton around 10 p.m. on the day that she is believed to have gone missing was in fact sent that day. But that's all he would say about that. Right. Now, the reason why this is so interesting about this Snapchat, remember we said that he, that the Molly and Dalton would often communicate via Snapchat. So this Snapchat was opened up at 10 p.m. by Dalton. The reason why Dalton brings this up to law enforcement is he says, hey, look, there's a theory that she was out there jogging and was abducted while she was jogging. This Snapchat shows her to be indoors. Right. And this was sent to me. I opened up at 10 p.m. The problem is we, the public, we don't know when that Snapchat was sent. She could have sent that, took that that Snapchat sent it before she even went out jogging that night. Right. I'm sure that is a big piece of information though, for police as they might be able to identify whose home she was standing in or what building she was in when that was created. And this puts us, you know, we're in a fascinating time because what we do know is that she had communications through text messages, communications through social media platforms We also know that she wore a Fitbit Mm -hmm. all the time. She was wearing the Fitbit on a run. She's wearing her cell phone on the run. So therefore, we know that these pieces of technology might lead to actual evidence later. And we also hear that again in this press conference. This is where the sheriff confirmed that the investigators believed that they would be able to take useful information from the Fitbit data, which they had been able to obtain, obtain. 
But they would not discuss that further, obviously, and should not right. uh, in this press conference. He also stated that they had collected video footage from all of the stores along Molly's regular running routes, as well as any private citizens who might have had surveillance cameras. On July 31st, the Associated Press reported that it had interviewed a neighbor of Jack's. Uh, this is Dave Collum. He told the AP the following. He had been interviewed by investigators. They had told him data from Molly's Fitbit showed she jogged past his home on that evening, the, the evening in question. Right. He told the AP what, while he had indeed seen Molly on previous runs and was a regular at church with her and her family so he could easily identify her, he could easily spot her. Yeah. Uh, he had not seen her run by his home on the 18th. Dave also said investigators told him Molly was doing homework on her computer later that evening. Now, this is interesting. Why would investigators tell this guy this information if it were in fact true when they claim that they are t they're trying to keep everything close to the vest? Right. And but it's a small town. So, yes. So you also run into a situation where Yes, the police are keeping things close to their chest, but sometimes police officers, law enforcement, have people that they have to, you know, get some of this off their chest, if that makes any sense at all. Well, if it's in fact true, you know, we're right. talking about at the time, law enforcement kind of refusing to elaborate on the timeline that they had claimed that they had established. Now, reasons for this information, if in fact, now we're going off of if this Dave Collum guy is telling the truth. Right. He could have gotten confused during the course of the interview. Or, or again, like we said, when people spotted her running, he could be confused on what day she was out doing her homework. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's, but, but according to his claims was that night, that, that later that night they had police had evidence that suggested she was at home working on homework at some point. No, I understand that, but I'm just saying that he could be confused and it was the night before. I just wonder why, if in fact they did tell him this information, what was the strategy there? You know, was it to plant this in the public's mind, perhaps to manipulate the investigation in some way? Or were they, did they want to give this information to Dave just to see what he would do with it? Right. You know, uh, they had to suspect that he would probably tell somebody about this. The interesting thing though, is that Dave shares a last name with Morgan column who we know to be Molly's cousin. So if Dave is potentially related or somehow related to the Tibbetts family, then maybe law enforcement told him this something that they didn't share publicly because he was in fact related or is he a suspect at that time when you're sitting down talking with him? Are you saying, you you know what, we, we do have some information that she was in this area. Right. We don't know what happened after that. Let's throw some possible scenarios out there to see what he, how he reacts to it. And law enforcement is doing a really good job of keeping things close to the vest, but I'm sure they're sharing more things with the family than they have shared with the media. And then the family's do, been doing a good job of keeping information uh, that they need to hold back back yes but we did hear this from laura from molly's mother early in the investigation she had said that a quick look at internet history on molly's laptop after it was retrieved from the jack's house suggested that molly had been working on a homework assignment for her roman civilization class mm -hmm. now the family told a local tv news show that they had been told this by authorities, that, Amal, that Molly appeared to have been working on her computer later in the evening on the 18th. However, this was an early theory. We need to keep that in mind. This was an early theory, and Laura would later warn us, warn the public, that it is unclear exactly when the laptop was used that evening and cautioned against anyone drawing any firm conclusions from that information. Right. This is very confusing when I was looking it up because to me, if she's abducted when she's out running to me, that points more so towards somebody that she possibly doesn't know. And then if she's abducted from that house, that some individual would have to know that she was at that home by herself. Um, Yes, or out running by herself. 
with no one to account for her for several hours after she would return from that run. Well, during this search, we're going to find an item, and it's not really clear if it's Molly's or if it's not Molly's. This has been a weird thing here, Captain, and it started off very weird, and maybe it's just not been cleared up. So on July 27th, the Washington Post reported that authorities said Molly may have been wearing denim shorts and a red T-shirt when she disappeared. Now, this is completely a complete different description than what we were told before. Right. Apparently. But hold on. That goes back to the idea of did she make it back home? Yeah, it goes because it goes if, back to the, we don't know when she if she was abducted. We don't know when she was abducted. Right. And the thing here with this red shirt, the the reason why it could be significant is that it is believed, and actually I think there's a good amount of proof, that she did own a red shirt. Now, was it this one that was later found? We don't know. Right. Let's talk about this. So Molly was issued by the summer camp that she worked for a red T-shirt, possibly multiples of the same T-shirt. Some reports said that she would have wore that red shirt for a field trip that was scheduled for the 19th. Yeah, everybody's going to wear these red shirts. Right. So it's easy for the the kids or whoever's on this uh, trip to identify the people that they're with. Right. Reports surfaced in early August that a red shirt similar to the one Molly had owned for work had been found in a ditch by someone mowing grass near the Lincoln Wildlife Area. This is about 15 minutes away from Brooklyn by car. This report, which has absolutely never been confirmed, it provoked a frenzy of speculation. Of course, what if the whole timeline was different? What if Molly had been abducted on the morning, maybe even the morning of the 19th when she was preparing to leave for work? Right. Then she would have been wearing the red shirt or believed to have been wearing this red shirt. We have Kevin Winkler of the Iowa Department of Public Safety. He told a press conference that he had, quote, no information to confirm that anything belonging to Molly had been found. In other words, this would include the red shirt. The red shirt in the ditch had not been linked to Molly as far as they were concerned. Yeah, but this is where the red shirt gets a little more strange, Mm -hmm. is that it's found close to this pig farm. Yes. And this pig farmer, he's kind of an odd dude. I think that's like the requirement to be a pig farmer. No. Odd dude. I I actually... uh, I'm joking. I used to teach a guy that was a pig farmer, and he was one of the most stand-up guys I've ever met. Um, Just, you know, a gem. I like the cut of his jib. Shout out to the farmers. You are the backbone of America. Okay, so this takes place, Captain, in late July. Investigators are conducting... There's a very key word here in this sentence a targeted search of a former hog farm. Yeah. Targeted search of a former hog farm and question the previous owner. Now this is convicted stalker Wayne Cheney. He's 56 years old. I don't know if he's actually convicted. I think he was brought to trial. I heard seven times, but every time the, it was dropped. Do you want to go through his, uh, you want to do a whole, a little, little rap sheet rundown of sure. Mr. Cheney. Let me know what he was actually charged with. Okay. So I mean, that's what I heard in the, the news multiple times was he was charged seven times, but every time it was brought to court, it was dismissed. Well, no, you're you, those, that statement is pretty accurate. Okay. Okay. He has been charged with a lot. He okay. hasn't been convicted of as many things as he's been charged with. A lot of his charges, as you stated, were dismissed at some point. But according to Iowa court records, um, he has a bunch of convictions, things that he would plead guilty to or was found guilty of. So he has been found guilty of harassment in the second degree in 2009, contempt violation of no contact or protective order in 2010, criminal trespassing in 1996, harassment by communication in 1996. Harassment in the first degree in 2009, interference with official acts in 2009, improper use of media in 2015. I don't know what that was what that? that charge means. Improper use of media. Uh, that's p- podcasting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. um, 
stalking violation of protect protection of order found guilty in 2014 and contempt violation of no contact or protective order in 2011. Right. So this guy seems creepy, but you know, mind you, we have no reports that Molly claims that she's being stalked. Well, we also have no evidence that the two would have known each other for any reason right. at all. Um, so, but just to go back to what you had brought up, captain, you are absolutely right. I know I just read down a whole bunch of stuff here, but he has in fact been charged with a lot of stuff that was dismissed. And I don't have the particulars of why that was dismissed. Sometimes people are being charged with something and they're just straight up innocent. Right. Um, these protective, uh, we see constantly this violation of protection order. From my understanding, he's had some nasty breakups with girlfriends. And I think that he is, uh, maybe not handled himself in the most gentlemanly way mm -hmm. when breaking up with a girlfriend. These violations though, can be tricky. And to be honest with you, if you want to watch about five episodes of the TV show cops, you'll figure out why this charge and conviction is tricky to try to figure out what that may mean. But as the captain was stating, that red shirt was found about a mile from that home. Now, Cheney lived in a trailer home about 500 yards from that farm, which he had sold to a large conglomerate a few years before. The farm is located at 2161 47th, I'm sorry, 470th Avenue in Deep River, which is about 15 miles from Brooklyn. It is routinely referred to in the press as, quote, pig farm. And Cheney is as, quote, the hog farmer. But neither is actually accurate. The farm was apparently no longer a producer of hogs, and Cheney was not working there any longer and had not owned it for a few years. Well, that would leave him with a lot of time on his hands. Um, the other weird thing here, though, was I think law enforcement questioned him at least five times. And uh, they asked him to take a polygraph. Mm -hmm. uh, he he refused. And then once that got into the media, um, I think the he got turned on, up on him a lot. And he ended up agreeing to take a polygraph. And from the reports, I found that he actually passed the polygraph. Well, the other thing, too, is the rumors that came about once it was made public that they were talking to this guy, looking at the farm area, and asked about the polygraph. Was The rumors were that they were searching him that it was a targeted search because that they had possibly law enforcement had possibly found information on Molly's Fitbit to lead them to this area or had found the Fitbit itself. Now, both of those, that's just speculation and, yeah, well, and probably not accurate. Well, but, but law enforcement could be lying on the idea that he passed the polygraph test. We don't know. I mean, if they have this information that the Fitbit took them to that location, I mean, this is your prime suspect then, but we don't know what they're holding back. The, the, in an interview that I found from Fox news, Chenny, he, he appeared to be very nervous. He was yeah. anxious. He was fidgeting. Um, but he made a statement that I hated was at one point they said, uh, uh so law enforcement has questioned you multiple times. He goes, yeah, they're just wasting my time. Like, well, sorry to waste your time. Dick knows. But we got a missing girl here. You well, I mean, like she's a little more important than your precious time. Dick knows. He also said in the uh, interview that the FBI had questioned him for about two hours, but he couldn't remember what they had asked him. They couldn't. He couldn't remember specific questions hmm. um, regarding the lie detector test or the polygraph. I should say the information I found he had stated was that he did not know the results of that test mm. to be clear. As far as I could find as of this morning, he's not technically been named a person of interest in this case, although there must be something or some reason for them to have questioned him so many times and searched his former property. Now we do know that they searched his trailer. They searched a uh, garage and portions of that quote unquote pig farm. Well, to be fair to Captain Dick Nose, pig farmer, there's some other suspects that the media has been talking about. Well, two other men were, were looked at into that we know of. There could be many more, yeah. but the two that are on the radar, so to speak, was 
uh, stemming first from stemming from a situation in early August when police in Dubuque, this is a town on Iowa's border, the border with Wisconsin and Illinois, they arrested a man accused of assaulting a jogger. Assistant Police Chief Jeremy Jensen told Fox News the jogger had stated to investigators she was running near the city's fire station on July 29th when she was approached by a man who had offered her flowers and then tried to grab her. The Dubuque Police Department statement about the incident read, The male subject later identified as Greg Langell, age 22, of Dubuque, grabbed the female victim's arm when she refused to give him her phone number. Mm. She was able to pull her arm away and kicked Langell when he tried to grab her again. The department said they tracked a suspicious vehicle observed by traffic cameras in the area of the reported assault back to this individual. He has been charged with assault and was taken into custody. As of now... The case currently has no ties to Molly's disappearance that we know of. We don't know whether Langell had been targeted, had targeted this jogger specifically right. that they knew each other. Although the flowers, either that's just super weird or it would seem to me to indicate more of a specific interest in this individual. Yeah, maybe, or he's just a complete creep and he decided that, Oh, I got some flowers and here's this jogger and, Hey, you want some flowers? Oh, you don't want flowers from a stranger? You know, let me grab your arm. I mean, I don't know. Well, the other incident took a place in Pella, which is an hour's drive away from Brooklyn. Police took a man in for questioning on July 31st after he was captured on surveillance footage taking pictures of female joggers. The man turned himself in to authorities when he heard that they were looking for him. Pella Police Chief Robert Bokinski told WHO-TV that the man, quote, as convertly as he possibly could, took photos of the female joggers unbeknownst to them. It seemed to be very creepy, end quote. Now, we should be, we got we to gotta make sure that we state this here. This man did come forward. They said, hey, we're looking for you. He comes forward. He says, I was the guy taking the pictures of the joggers. Law enforcement in Pella comes out later and says, hey, we've spoke to the man. He told us why he was taking the pictures. We're not releasing that information, but we want to make you make it aware. We have not charged him with anything, and it's not illegal to be in a public place and take pictures. So this man's not been charged should with be. anything. <laughs> well, it should be if you're just going to drive around and take pictures of people without them knowing. Well, but again, he, he explained why he was taking the pictures. We don't know what was explained to law enforcement. Now, by July 28th, a reward amount skyrocketed to over $300,000. Now, a tactic that we have seen before, Captain, the parents declared that the award would be available even to the abductor. Her parents also started a Facebook group dedicated to the case. Now, there were believed to be some sightings of Molly while she was still missing. One included a sighting at a truck stop in Kansas City, Missouri. Information I found, Captain, while it was huge speculation at the time and, and widely regarded by the public that, hey, Molly could still be alive, she could still be out there, she was sighted at this truck stop, we had her family that came out and said, look, if she was abducted, she would have been fighting this individual. They're, they're, she wouldn't have been sitting there so, you know, willing to be there. Right. Or well, just. Unless she knew the person. Correct. And the information that I found, Captain, says that it turned out that it's believed that that sighting is not accurate, that that was not her that was sighted on that day. And this was, this was the, like the sighting heard around the world because. It was the number one trending thing on Facebook that day. Yeah. And then on August 5th, another incident, we have a body of a white woman was found who appeared to be in her mid twenties turned up in Lee County, which is an hour's drive Southeast of Brooklyn, Iowa. Yeah. This turned out to be Sadie Alvarado age 20 and a 20 year, a 28 year old man, her boyfriend believed to be her boyfriend has been charged with her death. And like I said earlier, I mean, I, I received personally hundreds 
of people asking us to cover this case to shine light on the on her disappearance and now the day that we decide to record the episode and release it to the world they have now found her body uh, it's been a pretty uh, tough day yes and our hearts and our thoughts go out to molly's family and friends We want to thank everybody for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for sharing on social media. And thanks for giving us five-star reviews on iTunes. It means a lot. And here in the garage, we are working very hard to get part two out of this case today. So please join us here in the garage. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't let it.